Good evening, my friends. This nice looking gentleman in front of Oscar there is Wayne Wilson. Uh, we met years ago when I introduced myself as Dennis the Minister, or maybe you heard me say that. And he told me he was George Wilson. That's the neighbor, you know, who uh, Dennis was always giving trouble to. His, his name is actually Wayne. And uh, he's with the Gloucester Street Church in Tupelo, a place that I've been, not recently, but I have spoken there times past. We know a lot of the same people. He knows uh, a couple of our uh, former faculty members, Dr. Nathan Seegers, who I think is uh, now part of the family through marriage, and then Dr. Stephen Guy and their wives. And so we're glad that Wayne is with us for a couple of, uh, of weeks, and, uh, or for a short while, and we're just glad. Um, the Saints can always find, or almost always can find a way to win. So the defense did it for us this today. And so we're, I know the, those of you, and I, since I was never a, a fan of any pro team, now I'm a Saints fan. And so, uh, uh, but I like Dallas too, Randy. <laughs> I got to, I got to, I got to touch all the bases, you understand. Um, <clears throat> I, um. Uh, I've been chuckling all week about one of my grandsons, one of our grandsons. When I say mine, my wife will say, he's mine too. I say, okay, our. Um, but he's five. And Quinn is, has been one of, he's one of these kids that he started out talking like a grown-up. He never talked like a, a baby, you know. Anyway, he's five now. And so my wife was telling me that she had uh, Quinn and his three-year-old brother, Rhett, with her in Target, or as we say, Target. And um, they were shopping a few days ago. And Quinn notices some particular pajamas for sale. And he latches onto those pajamas and he wants those pajamas. I mean, it's almost like he's just got to have them. And my daughter, who's very picky, said they were just ugly. She said it wasn't that she was against buying him some more pajamas, but not those. They were ugly. So she wouldn't buy them. And she said, come on, come on, let's go. He tunes up and starts... (laughs) And he's going down the aisle. <laughs> and she says, come on, help me find an extension cord. He goes, I don't even know what that is, but I'm definitely not looking for it. <laughs> oh, that's my boy. So he was sad. In contrast to um, what you see on the screen about the blessing. Um, the word blessing, as it's used in the book of Revelation seven times, um, actually means happy. And so we're going to look at seven happy statements in the book of Revelation tonight, uh, which reminds me of another grandson's story. Our uh, oldest, Zach, when he was six years old, got in trouble at home and was grounded for a week. And uh, by Tuesday, I was just in agony for him. I was just so worried about Zach. First of all, I didn't want him to get into more trouble than the grounding be extended, you know. So uh, I get him on the phone, and I'm talking to him, and I said, how you doing with the, you know, in, the incarceration you're under there? And uh, he said, I'm okay, Papa. Uh, and, I, and he said, but when Saturday comes, he said, I said, when Saturday comes, you're going to be happy. He says, well, I'm happy now. But he said, when Saturday comes, I'm going to be happy, happy. Well, that's what the Revel- book of Revelation is talking about in these seven statements, that um, it's uh, God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be happy, happy. And he says, uh, there are some ways in which if these things are in your life, and if these things are a part of uh, of your faith and of your Christian walk, then you will be happy. And so let's go next slide to um, Revelation chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 3. And this is what the scripture says. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now we know of course that the book of Revelation is an apocryphal book which means that it uses a symbolic language and when he says the time is near he's simply saying that there is a time coming in which... um, Not only uh, is there going to be great persecution, but there's also going to be great delivery because God is going to 
discipline those who are we're talking about Rome primarily, who are persecuting God's children. Uh, this is Colossians 4.16. Let's read this together. Um, after this letter, you see, because what we're talking about is in order to be blessed, we need to be willing to read the Word of God and understand the Word of God. So this is what the Scripture says in Colossians 4.16. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from, the, from Laodicea. And so scripture is teaching that scripture is to be read. There's a, a very familiar verse uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, that, are, that is often used with young people where Paul, who is the teacher, tells Timothy, the student, do not let older people disrespect you because you are young. So we, we all know verse 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. But the next verse says this. Give attention to the doctrine, to the teaching, and to the reading of the word. And so Paul is simply telling uh, um, Timothy, read the word. Just the same thing that's said in Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed are those who read and understand the word. Uh, Mark Twain said, uh, it's not um, the parts that people don't understand about the Bible that bothers them. It's the part that they do understand. And yet, uh, it's very important not only to read the word, but to seek to understand it. In Acts chapter 8, verse 30, we see Philip, uh, and, and he's observing a man riding in a chariot, and this man has scripture, a big scroll, and he's reading the scroll. He's actually reading from Isaiah, and he's reading about the Lord, but he doesn't understand what he's reading because it's, a, it's prophecy. And so um, uh, Philip winds up riding with him in the chariot, and he said to him, Do you understand what you are reading? And the man said, uh, you know, how, how can I understand unless someone help me understand? So blessed is the person who not only reads the Word of God, but understands the Word of God, and then, of course, obeys the Word. This is 2 Thessalonians 3.14, where the Scripture says this, If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him. Get back away from people who don't read the Word, they don't understand the Word, or if they do, they refuse to obey the Word. And so that's very important. Next slide talks about being prepared. And we're going this time to chapter 16 in the book of Revelation. Each one of these will take us back to the book of Revelation. And this is chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. I don't know if um, this has ever happened to you, but uh, it's happened to me twice, I think. And that is that uh, I'll be in a hotel and the fire alarm will go off. And, you know, you're supposed to get out of that room and find the stairways. You don't go down the elevator and you get on down to the lobby. Uh, fortunately, both times with me, it's been a false alarm. But I've seen some really funny and embarrassing sights, people who just didn't have any, they just left their room and they didn't have any clothes ready to be seen in public. And so they're down there in their jammies, and jammies, and some of their jammies are, are kind of uh, hilarious. And so the scripture is saying, blessed are those who are prepared when uh, important things happen, such as the coming of the day of the Lord. This is Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, we're looking at verse 42 and following. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man, talking about Jesus, will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So the blessing is in being prepared. Um, again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, the scripture says the same thing, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And we all know that the thief never uh, lets us know that he's coming. 
He tries to, sh- he shows up at a time in which we least expect him. And the same thing is true of the coming of the Lord. And so we need to stay prepared. You know what the definition of luck is? I know you've heard this. Luck is when preparation and opportunity intersect. And a lot of people call it luck. But luck is only for the prepared who know an opportunity when they see it. So the blessing of being prepared. Next slide. The blessing of being invited. Back to Revelation we go. And this time we're looking at chapter 19. We're looking especially at verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited. Now who are the invited as the book of Revelation uh, is talking about? Well, it's those who have believed and obeyed the gospel. These are who will be invited on that great and final day. Um, we do a fundraiser in Nashville every year for Heritage Christian. And um, there's always a group that comes over from White Bluff, Tennessee. And you heard me mention, I think, last month that I was going to White Bluff, Tennessee. And there was a man in the audience who lives in that neighborhood. He was visiting. He's moving houses down here for this uh, for the big hospital that's being built in New Orleans. And he's a house mover and a building mover. And so he got a contract to come down here. Anyway, he says, so you're going to White Bluff. We talked a little bit about it. There's a story behind that. Um, because uh, it probably has happened for about three years now that Jerry Butler uh, got one of the elders at White Bluff. And that church has sent us a check every month since the early 70s. And he'll say to me at that event, Dennis, when are you going to come to White Bluff? And I said, Jerry... I would love to come just any time. Now, he knows about my work with you, but he also knows that I can get away sometime. And so he, um, and, I, and so I said, Jerry, I just need to be invited. And he said, well, you're invited. I said, okay, when? Well, just any time. Well, I said, I need a date. And so this has gone on for two or three years now. And so last year, same thing. And, of course, he forgot as soon as he went and got in his car. And so um, after two or three months, I, I realized he's not going to invite me. He's not, but he's going to get on my case again next year because I don't show up at White Bluff. And so I call him and I say, look, I'm inviting myself because uh, you're, you're, if you're not going to invite, he just laughed and said, when can you come? And we're worked out a date. And of course, I told that story and, and had some fun with him when, we, when I got there uh, uh, about five or six Sundays ago. But you need to be invited. You can't just show up uninvited. And so the scripture says that if you have believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are invited. And that's the one. When you get to heaven or when you get to the pearly gate, so to speak, you're going to be, you have been invited to come on in and live forever. Next slide. The scripture says this in chapter 20 of Revelation. Of course, some of you were in my class last year when we um, took a year to walk through the book of Revelation. And look, we just we just skimmed the surface. I mean, you could spend a long time studying all the symbols and all the prophecy, getting back in the book of Ezekiel in particular and and uh, and and learning all the meaning of the book of Revelation. But if you understand the, the central theme of Revelation, it's simply this. If we will be faithful, no matter what kind of persecution we are suffering, the Lord will do two things. He will deliver us and give us eternal life, and He will punish those who are persecuting us. That's what's being told, and that's what's being taught in the book of Revelation. And so, again, we're in chapter 20, and this is verse 6, where the Scripture says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection, The second death has no power over them. Now, that second death is hell. The first resurrection is baptism. And it's baptism in which we are resurrected from the old life into a new life. And in order for there to be a resurrection, there must be a death. Well, what kind of death do we experience when we're baptized? We die to the old person, to the old uh, way of life. And we rise or we were resurrected to a new life. And the scripture says we walk in newness of life because we are avoiding hell. Well, the scripture says in in Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and we're looking at verse 1 in particular. As for you, 
You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but made alive. Of course, the scripture goes on to say uh, when you were uh, made alive in Christ. Romans 6, let's go to that. This is very familiar scripture. As a matter of fact, I know I've used this recently and so is Eric. Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in the, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And so the scripture is saying that the, uh, the, the first resurrection is baptism and then the second death is hell itself. Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And that means spiritual death, which means uh, uh, an eternal hell. But it's a wonderful blessing to know that we are, we are blessed with avoiding this awful, terrible plague. Somebody said to me in this, in this congregation not long ago, when are you going to preach on hell? You never preach on hell. We never hear anything about hell. Well, I've got a good hot sermon on hell, and uh, I've got it filed away in my, in my mind, and I'm going to deliver it sometime. Uh, and, and just we'll talk about what is hell, what's the nature of it, and so forth. But right now, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. And here Jesus is talking about Judgment Day. And he's talking about the great separation of the saved and the lost. And listen to what he says about those who are lost. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. Skipping on down to verse 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so the blessing of avoiding hell is a wonderful blessing. And the scripture is saying that ought to make you happy to know that you're not going to that awful place. Next slide. This time we're looking at verse 22. The last page in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, the blessing of keeping the word. Another way of saying that is obeying the word. And yet, when we look at Luke chapter 8, verse 15, the scripture says that people with a noble and good heart are those who, who, who hear the word and they keep it in their heart with patience. And they bring forth spiritual fruit as a result of that. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejects my word has one that judges him. For the word that I've spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. So we're reading Revelation 22, 7, where the scripture says this. Behold, this is Jesus talking, of course. Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is he who keeps the word. The psalmist said, in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hidden in my heart. In other words, I've taken your word, I've taken it to heart, I'm keeping it in my heart, and I'm going to always be obedient to it. That's the essence of the teaching uh, from the psalmist there. Next slide, the blessing of dying in the Lord. Now, death, of course, can be a blessing and is a blessing and is designed to be a blessing for those who are forgiven of their sins. Now, it's a day to be dreaded for those who have neglected or rejected salvation. But for those of us who have embraced the grace and the mercy and the love of God, and we have, re we have uh, uh, taken the gift, received the gift that he's offered us, which is forgiveness of sins through Christ, then there is a blessing in death. I don't know, um, uh, and, and of course, I, I, perhaps this is, you, you've, you, maybe you haven't experienced this, and if you haven't, I'm glad. Uh, but being uh, in ministry uh, all these years, um, I have uh, been at the bedside of, uh, of a number of people who were suffering, suffering, suffering so badly. I'm talking about excruciating pain. And they were looking forward to dying just to be relieved of the pain. That was their primary. Uh, and, and, but also uh, to know that they can get away from this painful existence and be with the Lord. And so blessing, or rather death, can be a blessing to those who are 
um, in the Lord. And so he's reading, it says this in verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. And from now on, yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. And so the scripture says death is a blessing. Hold that. Let's go to chapter 21. And we're looking at verse 4. Talking about when we get over on the other side. He, talking about God, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So blessed are those who die in the Lord because their suffering is over and now they can rest. And by the way, uh, the word rest doesn't mean rest just like lying on a couch or, uh, or relaxing in a hammock. It means that we will be refreshed. You know, hopefully all of us will live to be feeble old men and women and um, we'll enjoy all the benefits of being old folks. But... Um, but, but you see, the older our bodies get, the less energy we have and the less strength we have and all that. But when we die in the Lord and we get our new body, we're going to be refreshed. It's more than just having a good nap or having a good nutritious meal. We're going to be young again. We're going to have energy and we're going to feel good. And we're not going to have any kind of pain or suffering or anything like that. But he says it happens to those who die in the Lord. Well, how do you die in the Lord? Well, in order to die in the Lord, you've got to be in the Lord. Because the scripture says in Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings are in the Lord or in Christ. Well, the scripture says that when we become a Christian, as believers repenting of sin, confessing our faith in Jesus, and being buried with him in baptism... Galatians 3.27, that we are baptized into Christ. And by the way, there you will not find any other way to get into Christ except through the believer's baptism. You check it out in the scripture and see. You can't repent your way into Christ even though we're supposed to repent. You can't believe your way into Christ even though we're commanded to believe. You can't confess your way into Christ even though we are to confess faith in Jesus. The only way the scripture teaches that you can get into Jesus is to be baptized into his death. And when we're baptized into Jesus, uh, then we are in the Lord. And sometimes the scripture will use that phrase in other ways. As a matter of fact, I heard, uh, I heard a, another scripture sometime today. Maybe, I don't know if it was Eric's sermon or maybe in our class today, uh, something about being in the Lord. I know uh, we're told to, if we remarry, uh, we're, we're, we're told to remarry in the Lord, things like that. But in the Lord simply means to, if you remarry, marry a Christian. And so marry a believer, someone who has submitted to the, uh, the authority of Jesus. And so the blessing of dying in the Lord is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Next slide. The blessing of eternal life. And we're, or again, we're on the last page of the Bible, Revelation 22. And we're looking at verse 14. Where the scripture says this. Blessed are those who wash their robes. That means, what to wash robes mean to do his commandments. Some translations say that. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Why? Because what happens to those who have washed their robes or who have done the commandments of Jesus? That they may have the right to the tree of life. And the, the, the phrase tree of life means eternal life. You know, a few moments ago, I quoted Romans six twenty three, where the scripture says, For the wages of sin is death. But that's not all that scripture says. The second part of it says, But the gift of God is eternal life. And how does Psalm 23 end in verse 6? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Last slide. The blessing of being blessed. This, of course, is not Revelation. This is James chapter 1, verse 12. But let's read that verse together. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, or the woman, because when he has or she has withstood the test, he or she will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, what does that mean? That means it's a blessing to be victorious over temptation, over persecution, over doubt, 
over weariness, over discouragement, or anything else. To hang in there and to keep our faith and to continue to trust in the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is the person who is victorious over the challenge of living the Christian life. And so, the blessing uh, of revelation, the blessing of reading and understanding His Word, the blessing of being prepared, the blessing of being invited, the blessing of avoiding hell, the blessing of keeping the Word in our hearts, the blessing of dying in the Lord, and the blessing of eternal life. It's just blessed to be blessed. That's what James says in James 1 verse 12. Thank you for your kind attention tonight as we sing this song of encouragement and invitation. You know, the Lord has invited you and he's reaching out to you. And if he can help you, forgive you, if you need him in any way, he's available to you. And he wants to bless you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to give you peace and forgiveness. And tonight... As we sing this song of encouragement, if you need the Lord for any reason, either as a non-Christian who wants to become a Christian, receiving baptism for forgiveness of sin, or a Christian who has drifted away and you want to come back to the Lord, just want you to know He'll take you back. He's reaching out for you right now. Would you come to Him as together we stand and sing?